Amen. Great song, great thought, great job. What a great Savior. Go ahead and get in your Bible, if you would, to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, if you don't have a Bible with you there, we'll be on one near you. It's got a hard black cover. We'll be on page 729, Matthew 27. Easter is a special uh, day for everyone, but it is uh, a special day in, uh, for me personally. Um, 40 years ago on Easter Sunday, uh, I gave my heart to Jesus. And um, there was a lot of sins that he needed to wash away. And he did. And he changed my life. He's alive. And if you don't know him yet as Savior, he's not just fire insurance for the day you die. He is the friend who sticketh closer than the brother while you live. And I would to God you would give your heart to Jesus today. I would. Matthew chapter 27, we are breaking away from our normal Sunday morning series uh, that we've been in for the last few months because of the holiday. Uh, America has been in the past called a Christian nation by some people. But even in the best of the times, I personally wouldn't do that because I do not believe nations can become Christian. Uh, individuals become Christians. But I do agree with what they meant by that in that there was a much larger percentage of Americans who were true Christians and Judeo-Christian values characterized our culture in a way that is long gone today. In fact, Easter being on our national calendar, so to speak, is a remnant of those days. But despite the humanistic philosophy that dominates our culture, Easter is a holiday that reminds everyone in America of some great truths. Easter is not about candy eggs or cash eggs or colored eggs, though we had all of those around our house. It's not about chocolate bunnies, bunnies in baskets with fake grass or new clothes, though there's nothing wrong with either of those, and I don't have anything new on today. Easter is a time of year when even in our humanistic culture, everyone is reminded that Jesus of Nazareth died on the cross for the sins of the world and rose again after three days. What a great truth to be reminded of. If you want a snapshot of where American culture is today compared to what it was at times past, I'm told that 83% of Americans will in some way have something to do with an Easter egg hunt but 37% of Americans will somewhere be in church today. Despite that in our culture, everyone is reminded of the suffering and death of Jesus of Nazareth for the sins of the world and his glorious resurrection. When we begin to think about who the greatest individual in history was, there is no honest debate that the greatest individual in human history was Jesus of Nazareth. Now, you might be able to debate which day was the greatest day in human history, whether it was the day of his birth or the day of his death or the day of his resurrection, but there is no doubt he is the most incredible individual, and all three of those days are the most important days in history. And though I don't know which one is most important, I do know that if it were not for those three days in human history, there would be no hope in this broken world. I hope you understand that the message of evolution and humanistic philosophy is that there is no hope. According to them, you and, you and I are accidents. According to, the, you and I, uh, according to them, you and I have no real purpose to life. According to them, there's nothing waiting after life. What a bleak view of mankind and life. I'm glad the scriptures teach something different. If you would begin to play that video, please. On March of 2023, a man named Francis Zuber was skiing down the slopes of Mount Baker in the northwest corner of Washington State. He happened to have his sports camera on. Uh, he got off balance. He ended up off course through some pine trees, and he fell in some deep, powdery snow. By the time he fell and picked himself up, he recognized that he was several yards from any of the trails in a place where no one could see. But when he stood up, he noticed the top of a snowboard 
sticking out of the snow near him. And he went over to investigate. When he reached the snowboard, he found someone was still attached to the board and buried nearly upside down in the snow. By the way, if you don't know this, people suffocate buried in snow like that in just a few moments. Francis began frantically digging and crying out to the skier, Are you all right? Are you all right? Are you all right? After a moment or so, he finally reached the head and mask of the skier, who was still thankfully conscious and breathing. The upside-down snowboarder was Ian Steger, who had also taken a bad fall and was buried out of everyone's sight, upside down in the snow and unable to get himself out. Here's what Ian said. He said, one of the things that I was thinking about while I was down there was like, wow, I'm going to die down here. It was hopeless. Experts say that there was no way Ian could have ever freed himself. And Ian Steger's situation, though it seemed hopeless to him, stuck and running out of oxygen under the snow, uh, there was hope because Francis found him. It seemed as if everything was going to be over. But thankfully, it wasn't over for Ian Steger. The story of Ian Steger did not end with him buried and running out of oxygen under the snow. If you would stand this morning, please, in honor of the Word of God. Tell my thought this morning is Christ's story does not end at the cross. Christ's story does not end at the cross. Matthew chapter 27, we begin in the Word of God, where it says in verse 33, And when they were come into a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him, and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. And set up over his head was his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest this temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, <laughs> himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him. For, for he said, I'm the son of God. And the thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. And Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. I think he might be seated. While he lived, multiplied thousands gathered to hear and see Jesus of Nazareth. No man ever spake like he spake. The clarity and boldness of the truth he spoke, the compassion in his tone and his gentle demeanor were unique to him. While he lived, multiplied thousands gathered to see him do incredible things that no one else had ever done like he did them. Blind people instantly received their sight. Those who were deaf instantly were able to hear again. Those who were outcasts with leprosy were healed instantly with a touch or a word. Devils immediately obeyed his voice to leave the pawns they occupied. He was unique to history. In fact, all of history is his story. 
He defied gravity to walk on the water. He defied nature to calm the wind and the storms of the sea. He defied death to call the departed spirit of a young girl, of a widow's son, and Lazarus. He called them back from death into their lifeless body. There was none like he. Thousands had their life changed in some way by him. He didn't only change people's minds, he changed their hearts. He changed the hearts of hardened religious hearts of Pharisees to wicked and pure hearts like the man and the maniac of Gadara. Jesus changed hearts. And anyone who would come to him and believe in him as the Son of God and Messiah and receive him as such with a humble spirit, he saved them and changed them. But now... He allowed himself to be taken by wicked hands and nailed to a cross. A criminal on his right hand and left just outside the walls of Jerusalem. Notice in verse 34, they offer him vinegar and gall. In verse 34, it says they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he tasted thereof, he would not drink. Vinegar mixed with gall was a kind of a pain uh, sedative type of thing, a natural painkiller that he refused. I mean, understand, he carried the full suffering of the nails and the humility and the spear and the thorns and the beating he had taken. Soldiers who nailed him to the cross gambled for his garments as he hung naked there in verse 35, and they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them and upon my vesture Did they cast lots? And that is a prophecy from Psalm 22 that Jesus' enemies unwittingly fulfilled. A prophecy spoken about the Messiah's garments 1,000 years before he was even born. The Roman governor Pilate had found no fault in Jesus at all, but Rome would acknowledge no king but Caesar, and that's why they nailed this accusation in verse 37 over his head in three languages in Latin and Greek and Hebrew. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Listen. He is the King of the Jews. There will be a day when Pilate and Caesar and every one of those Jewish leaders will bend the knee to Jesus of Nazareth. But that was not the day of his coronation. That was the day of his suffering. And so on that day, They mocked him there on the cross with a criminal crucified on either side of him. And we read about their mockeries in verse 39 through 42. And they wagged, uh, they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. I mean, they understood his claim. I mean, people today, if you're an Eastern religion person, you might think he is only a guru. And if you are someone who is a Jehovah's Witness, you might think he's only a mighty God, but not the mighty God. Listen, the Jews understood his claim. He claimed to be the Son of God, and they considered that to be blasphemy. They knew from verse 42 that he had saved others. (laughs) They thought he could not save himself. They challenged him to come down from the cross. They understood what he had said in verse 43. He said, I am the Son of God. People today may not understand the claims of Jesus of Nazareth, but those who knew him, those who heard him, they understood his claims. When they mocked him and he stayed on the cross, they had no idea that he could have at any moment called thousands of angels. They had no idea that he purposely stayed on the cross for the sins of those who mocked him. He did not stay there because he had to. He stayed there because others had no hope in their death or the death of those they loved without his death. There there was a supernatural darkness then for the last three hours that he hung there in verse 45. From the sixth hour, that's noon, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Now some well-meaning people who don't like the creator of the universe being able to override the natural laws that he designed, they don't like miracles in the Bible. This is not simply a solar eclipse. Listen, the solar eclipse that's coming on April 8th near us 
it will last for 4 minutes and 28 seconds. The longest mathematical possibility for the length of a solar eclipse is 12 minutes and 29 seconds. And if that were not enough, the fact that this lasted three hours, Luke 23, verses 44, says that this darkness was over all the earth. This was far more than a natural occurrence. Listen, even the sun refused to shine when the Son of God became sin for us. Beaten beyond recognition, his face swollen, his beard plucked, blood dripping from his brow from the thorns from his face from the beating from the nails in his hands and feet from his sides and back from the cruel roman whip there he hung between heaven and earth and even the sun refused to shine and he who was without sin became sin for us so that we could be made the righteousness of god in him and after six hours on the cross three in the light and three in the darkness he dismissed his spirit and gave his life. In verse 50, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the Holy Ghost. No one took Jesus' life. He gave his life. He had the power to lay it down. He had the power to take it up again. And the wages of sin is death. And the sinless Savior gave his life to pay those wages. He paid the wages in physical death when he died on the cross. He paid those wages in a spiritual death. And when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me at that very moment? He took on the hell of those who have sinned. You and I, our sin has earned us death, physical death. It has earned us spiritual death, the second death in hell. And there is no religion, there is no preacher, there is no pope, there is no priest that can wash away our sins, just the blood of Jesus. It seemed as if this was the end of Jesus of Nazareth when he bowed his holy head and gave up the ghost. Listen, Pilate and Herod rejoiced because it seemed as, they, as if they had victory over a rival king. But it wasn't over because the story of Jesus doesn't end on the cross. The Jewish leaders rejoiced because it seemed as if, if they'd crush an opponent to their religious traditions. An adversary they could not answer and they could not stump with their own questions. But despite what they thought, it was not over because the story of Jesus does not end on the cross. Followers of Jesus, when he was crucified, were thrown into deep depression and hopelessness. I mean, for three to three and a half years, they had followed him wherever he went. They believed that he was the Son of God. They believed that he was the Messiah. They had made great sacrifices socially. They had made great sacrifices economically. They had made great sacrifices in every way because they believed him to be that. And then now, he dies on the cross. It seemed to be over for the disciples. But it was not over because the story of Jesus does not end on a cross. The followers of Jesus, to them it seemed hopeless. They were upside down, so to speak, in the snow. With just a little time. Joseph of Arimathea, he obtained Jesus' body from the Romans in verse 59 and 60. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. He laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. Again, at the time, it seemed to be the end of all their hopes and dreams. Their faith had been crushed. The weight of the moment and their last glimmer of hope ended when the Roman spear pierced his side and out came blood and water just to confirm that he had actually died and the last glimmer of hope they had at that moment died. But the story of Jesus Christ does not end at the cross. The story of the disciples' hopelessness does not end on Golgotha's hill or in Joseph's new tomb. In fact, we're here this morning with a smile and hope for the future because the story of Jesus does not end at his cross. Look at Matthew chapter 28 and verse 1, just over a little bit. And in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, 
came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. Here it is. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Well, I've told you. <laughs> After three days of hopelessness, dawn finally comes on the first day of the week. The night before the disciples had went to bed, they were absolutely crushed. That morning when they got up at the first crack of dawn, they were still crushed and hopeless. But the story of Jesus doesn't end at the cross. You see, because on the third day, that great stone that covered the garden tomb had been rolled back by the angel, and that stone was not rolled back so that Jesus could get out. It was rolled back so that we could look in and understand that he was no longer there. The grave today as we stand here in my case or sit there in your case, the grave is successfully held Confucius. The grave successfully holds Siddhartha Gautama Buddha. The grave holds Mohammed, Joseph Smith, Charles Taze Russell, Mary Baker Eddy, and L. Ron Hubbard, but the grave could not hold Jesus of Nazareth. He is Lord even over death. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose a victor over the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose. He arose. Hallelujah, Christ arose. <laughs> we can only imagine how the news of verse 6 changed those disciples. He is not here for his risen, as he said. We cannot imagine how verse 7 changes disciples when the angel said to them that if they would go to Galilee, there shall ye see him. But we do know this, that after hearing this, they had great joy. In verse 8, they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy. And they did walk like it didn't matter to bring his, I'm sorry. And they did run to bring his disciples word. <laughs> I hope this morning that you recognize that the story of Jesus Christ doesn't end on the cross. It does not end in hopelessness. It ends in the light of resurrection. And whatever kind of hopelessness you're facing this morning with the circumstances in which you find yourself, I hope this morning you will allow the light of Jesus Christ being alive to shine into the darkness of your soul. He is risen as he said. And what I'd like to do this morning for just a couple of moments is make some applications and observations of the story of Jesus not ending at his cross. Here's number one. Christ's story doesn't end at the cross or on the first Easter. See, for the next 40 days, Jesus appeared from time to time to his disciples, culminating in them watching his ascension back to heaven. Though no unsaved person saw Jesus after his resurrection, there were over 500 brethren who saw him one time. And they were changed. Their life was forever changed by the knowledge that he was alive. You see, because Jesus' story didn't end that first Easter and his ascension 40 days later, 3,000 people were saved when Peter preached at Pentecost. Hundreds were saved and transformed in Jerusalem through the message and ministry of the apostles. Paul, who was a hater of Christians, a person who did everything he could to take them down, to uh, cast his vote, to have them executed. Listen, he was changed on his trip to Damascus because Jesus Christ is alive and his story doesn't end that first Easter. Because his story doesn't end that first Easter, Paul and those who traveled with him changed the known world with the gospel. One of their criticisms of Paul in the city of Thessalonica was that these that have turned the world upside down. 
You know how they turned the world upside down? They had a risen Savior. They knew Jesus was alive, and they acted like people needed to hear it, and they needed to live like it. Because Jesus' story didn't end that first Easter, John could be exiled on the Isle of Patmos 60 years later and see the resurrected Christ. John from the Isle of Patmos could hear Jesus' message to those seven churches in Asia. John, because Jesus was still alive 60 years later, could hear Jesus tell John so we could know how everything is eventually going to come to a close. Listen, the New Testament is a record of the living Savior transforming people's lives, planting churches throughout the known world. But it isn't just that Christ's story doesn't end in that first Easter. Here's the second thing. Christ's story doesn't end at the cross or with the completion of the New Testament. Do you know, the work of Jesus has continued now for almost 2,000 years. Through the centuries, the truth, when Jesus said uh, the gates of hell would not prevail against his church, listen, all throughout our world there have been churches just like this one who believe the Bible, who believe in salvation by grace, who believe Jesus to be the Son of God, and all over who had nothing to do with Rome. We are not Protestants. We did not come out of the Rome. We came out of the New Testament. And we are a link in a very ancient chain of people who have said, I believe the word of God. I believe Jesus of Nazareth is the son of God. I believe the Bible plan of salvation and grace through faith. And all through these centuries, the work of Jesus has gone on. The message of the living Christ made it to America and ultimately to the people in this room. Now, some of you were born into families and the living Savior had already transformed them, and from your earliest days, you were aware of the work and life and ministry of Jesus. Others of you are like me and my wife, who are transformed by the living Savior as adults, to allow him to change our marriage, to change the way we handled our children, to change the way we handled our home, to change the priorities of our life. But the message of Christ did not stop when the New Testament closed. It is still today right here. And today, in every corner of the globe, by one means or another, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is being proclaimed. Sometimes in a written track. Sometimes in a shortwave or regular radio broadcast. Sometimes on the internet. Other times by missionaries. One way or another, the message of Jesus Christ today covers our entire globe because the work of Jesus and the life and the story of Jesus did not end on the cross It is going on today still. This week, Bible Baptist Church began passing out 26,000 copies of the gospel. Do do you know why we did this and churches all over our world did this? Because the work of Jesus is going on today. His story did not end at the cross. And we're doing what we do for that exact reason. The story of Jesus did not end with the completion of the New Testament, but it is not just that Christ's story doesn't end with the completion of the New Testament and with your life and mine today. Here's our third thing. Christ's story not only doesn't end at the cross or with us today, his story will, be continue, will continue to be written for all of eternity. Listen, if you're here today and you're a true Christian, by the way, you don't become a true Christian sitting in a church any more than you become a car sitting in a garage. If you're here today and you're a true Christian, you today have everlasting life. And today, whenever the future day is, when you pass, your soul will go immediately to be with Jesus. Hear me when I say there's a day coming when Jesus will return in the clouds for true believers. What a day that will be for those who get to go. For anyone who's left behind, and there'll be people in this room left behind. There's people all over this room, and all you are is a Baptist. You know the facts of the gospel. You know the facts about Jesus. You believe that there's one God. James says, I believe it's one, that there's one God. Oh, that's good. The devils also believe and tremble. It is not enough to believe in God. If you believe in God and you really believe in him, you'll believe the message of his son, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten son of God who died on the cross for the sins of the world. That is what you need to do 
to become a true Christian. And there's a day coming, not only when he will come back in the clouds for his own and leave those behind for the terror of the Antichrist and the plagues of Revelation, there's a future day coming when he's going to come in power and glory and every eye shall see him. You think it's intimidating to listen to a loud old man up here talk about this stuff? It is nowhere near as intimidating as when the Son of God comes in the power and glory of God and melts the people who are lined against him in the Megiddo Valley and calls all the remaining human beings on the planet to the judgment of Matthew 25. Listen, the story of Jesus doesn't end with the New Testament. It does not end with the, uh, you and me here. He, his story will go on forever and ever and ever. Hey, there's a day coming when those who believe will be in the new Jerusalem and the gates of that city will be open to all the creation of God and God will make the, all, all the heaven and the earth new and we'll have access to all that. And the story of Jesus Christ, it will be written century after century after century. Won't it be a wonderful thing? Which gets us to our last thing. And I know you're saying, good, I'm hungry. Lastly, this morning, Christ's story will never end. He's an eternal king. But if he hadn't gone to the cross, there would be no forgiveness available for anyone. Listen, I can't give you forgiveness. Forty years ago, as a 24-year-old sinner of the worst sort, Christ forgave me. I can tell you how to be forgiven, but I can't forgive you. Only he can. Though his story did not end at the cross, though it seemed to, the cross of Christ was an essential part of the Messiah's story. You see, the cross was the plan of our creator from before the world began. See, the cross was not, wow, oh no, the Jews are rejecting him, what am I going to do now? That, that's not what happened. Their rejection of him, at least the majority of them, listen, God knew that was going to happen before there was even a world. It was all known to God that Christ would suffer, bleed, and die for the sins of mankind. Picture after picture in the Old Testament painted the Lamb of God who would one day take away the sins of the world. The blood of bulls and goats and lambs could only cover sins for a season, and they were all just a picture, a shadow, a type of the blood of Jesus Christ. Promise after promise in the Old Testament spoke of a Messiah who would set his people free. Human kings and governments are not the source of our freedom. Our unalienable right to be free comes from our Creator. And every human being, every, whoever you are today here, or anywhere else within the sound of my voice or the sound of anybody else preaching the Bible, you can freely choose Christ or you can freely choose to reject Him. But just because you choose your own way doesn't mean your way is going to work. We do freely choose what we do and then our God chooses the consequences of our choices. Hear me, there's only one parachute of salvation. One. There's a story told about a preacher, a boy scout, and a computer expert who were the only passengers on a small plane. The pilot came back to the cabin and he said the plane was going down, there were only three parachutes for the four of them. And then the pilot just blurted out, I should have one of the parachutes because I have a wife and three small children. And without waiting for them to say anything, he grabbed a parachute and he jumped. The computer expert, he next blurted out, I should have one of the parachutes because I'm the smartest man in the world and everyone needs me. And he also, without waiting for anything the two remaining people had to say, he just grabbed a parachute and jumped. The preacher turned to the Boy Scout and with a smile he said, young man, he said, I've lived a rich and a full life. I'm going to be with Jesus when I die, and I know it. So you take that parachute. I'll just go down to the plane. The Boy Scout looked up at him, and he smiled. He just says, relax, Reverend. 
the smartest man in the world just picked up my backpack and jumped. (laughs) There is only one parachute. That parachute is not me. That parachute is not the Baptist church. That that parachute is not baptism. That parachute is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man perish. You say, Brother Wally, I've got my own way, and I think it'll be okay. You can pick your own way. But you don't get to pick how your way turns out. That was picked. So I plead with you this morning in Christ's stead. If you're like me and my wife 40 years ago and you really, you believed in God, you knew the story of Jesus, but it was just not personal. I plead with you this morning Come to the living Savior and be saved. You'll never regret it. And if you're here and you are saved, Christ is in your life. Can I ask you just a basic question? Do you live like Jesus is alive? See, a lot of people who say they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, in effect, they live their life like he's not looking, like he doesn't care, like he doesn't have a plan. And I plead with you to live like Jesus is alive. You'll be glad you did. If you'd quietly stand this morning.